Welcome to Crescent City Crime, dear listeners. I'm Tracy. And I'm Brian. And thank you to everybody who has been listening to us. If you are a repeat listener, thank you for coming back. And if you are new here, welcome to the podcast. Welcome to the podcast, and we really do enjoy having you listen. And as always, our social media links will be in the show notes. But we always encourage people to tell their friends about us. And, of course... Tell your enemies. Especially your enemies. (laughs) And I wanted to remind everybody that the sticker giveaway is going to be active, I think, pretty much until I give away 25 stickers. Because I've already printed them out. So please, people... Click on the pinned Instagram post. I will put it up again on Instagram. I'll also put it up on Facebook. And I will link it in the YouTube video com or sorry, the YouTube video notes for this week as well. Sounds great. Sounds good. Yes. And I also wanted to tell everybody that in we are we are in the process of developing more content. We would like to give y'all an extra episode every month. And that's in the works. And we are doing it as a thank you, really, because we just so deeply appreciate having any kind of listenership at all. We certainly do. So... Today, we are kind of going back to the beginning. Brian, do you remember our first episode? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, don't, I don't remember the first episode. Oh, you don't remember how we talked about the death penalty? Oh, yes, that's right. Yes. And at that time, we briefly discussed Sister Helen Prejean, who was a person that's long fascinated me. Because, you know, people on death row are not nice people. They've done horrible things. Things that most of us in society would look at and go, yeah, I don't want to deal with that person at all. But a person like Sister Helen Prejean who feels a calling to see them as human beings is still an example to strive for, I think. Yes, it, 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 it is. It's it's she's a very special person and that she's she's able I mean for one aspect she's able to endure the presence of these people who are separated from society permanently for you know, for good reason because they, they simply can't function uh, lawfully in society without without harming people. And she's actually able to endure the presence of these people in order to do, you know, in her eyes to do God's work to try to administer to them, uh, you know, the opportunity to redeem themselves in the eyes of God, whereas, of course, they'll never be redeemed in the eyes of man. That's very well put. And I think it also comes down to the concept of justice. Everybody has their own idea about what justice should be, right? Like, ultimately, at the end of somebody's crime, there should be some sort of punishment. And, you know, it is... The death penalty itself is always going to be a topic that is fraught with debate... It's going to be a rough topic to, 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 to talk about with sometimes, and I understand that. But today's story is going to be... So, so, well, Sister Helen Prejean wrote the book Dead Man Walking, which then, of course, was adapted into a fictionalized version of her life, but probably not too far from reality. But the main character that was portrayed by Sean Penn in that movie was a combination of two of Sister Helen Prejean's inmates that she gave spiritual counsel to when they were on death row. This week we're going to talk about one of them, and next week we're going to talk about the other one. And then after that, 
I would like to discuss the woman herself, Sister Helen Brajon. Sounds good. Yes. So, are you ready to get into the episode proper? Ready. Okay. So, on November the 4th, 1977... 17-year-old David LeBlanc and his girlfriend, 18-year-old Loretta Ann Bork, attended the homecoming football game at Catholic High School in Iberia Parish, Louisiana. The young couple drove to a lover's lane in St. Martin Parish after the game, and around 1 a.m. they were approached by two men. The men were 27-year-old Elmo Patrick Sonnier and his younger brother, 20-year-old Eddie James Sonnier. They were armed with 22 caliber rifles and they identified themselves as police officers and they even flashed a, flashed a badge that one of the brothers had gotten while working as a security guard. They entered LeBlanc's car and told the couple that they were trespassing on private property and they were under arrest. They took the teenager's driver's licenses. They handcuffed David and Loretta and moved them to the back seat. They then told the couple that they were going to drive them to the home of the landowner to see if the owner wished to press trespassing charges. But the brothers were not really police officers, and the actions they took on that November night would shatter the lives of many. The Sonnier brothers were familiar with the area and knew where they could take David and Loretta to do whatever they wanted to them. That night, they drove them 21 miles to an oil field in Iberia Parish and parked by the road. They handcuffed David LeBlanc to a tree, and then they took Loretta from the car. Elmo raped her, and then the brothers told her that they would release both her and David LeBlanc unharmed if she had sex with Eddie James Sonnier. Now, this is coercion, and it's still rape. When you force someone to make this type of choice, it's not really consent. No, and also, law enforcement officers do not say that you're under arrest and then proceed to bring you to a property owner and ask if they want to press charges. Because if you're under, if you're under arrest, then that means you're going to be transported, of course, to a, you know, a prison facility, a lockup. And then it's up to the district attorney if charges are pressed against you at, at that at that point ultimately okay but the big another red flag there is law enforcement officers don't go around with 22 caliber rifles mm, right and the other problem of trespassing is typically you're not just simply arbitrarily arrested for trespassing you're uh, unless another crime is committed, unless you're suspected of committing another crime, you, you're you're typically first asked to leave. That's true. And then let's say if you're found on the premises later that day or another day, then you're not welcome back. Then you you'll be you know summarily arrested for trespassing on that instance. The only law enforcement I know of that uses 22 caliber rifles. Okay, two different instances. Jefferson Parish uh, Sheriff's Department SWAT team when uh, dispatching Nutra rats mm. typically from the back of an extended cab truck or wildlife and fisheries uh, for use in, in dispatching uh, you know, nuisance wildlife or da dangerous wildlife. Right. Well... <clears throat> Loretta did agree to have sex with Eddie. But in spite of all that being put upon the young woman, Elmo Sonnier decided against releasing them. He had previously served hard time in Angola, and he did not want to go back to prison. And this was when the brothers forced David LeBlanc and Loretta Bork to lie face down in a ditch. They turned their 22 caliber rifles upon them and shot them each three times in the head and ended their lives, which is so incredibly heartbreaking to think about those two young children. And to me, they are young children. Now, I know it 
17, 18 years old, you think you're an adult. And you are on the cusp of adulthood. You are. But you have the whole rest of your life ahead of you from that point. And this was taken away from, from, from those children viciously. It's, it's um, I'm not trying to make a joke. It's, it's similar to the, uh, to the plot of a beginning of a horror movie. It it is. It Whereas is. this this is this could also be taken as a as a as a cautionary tale. Because these these types of predators they they look for people in parks and in obscure places. And and the like the place that they transported them to, of course, it's what law enforcement calls the secondary crime scene, which is where they have all the time in the world to do what they want to you. Yes, and also at 17, 18 years old, you're pretty naive. You are. You just are. It's nothing wrong with that. We've all been there. But you would probably believe somebody who put on a good enough act that they are law enforcement. At that age, being naive, if you don't know any better, which, of course, it, probably if you knew better... You'd only know better if, say, someone in your family was law enforcement or if you were in one of those uh, police explorer or cadet programs. Right, right. Where you learn all about that kind of stuff. Hmm. You know. But if you're, you know, of course, as far as the secondary crime scene goes, if someone's trying to abduct you, uh, I mean, it's best to go ahead and risk injury. Or even risk death to avoid going to the secondary crime scene. Like if you're in a car, just drive away? Yeah. Yeah. Or if you're on foot, uh, run in the opposite direction of the car, of where the car be going. Ah, uh, yeah, so they'd have to turn around. Yeah, run against traffic so that if they want to pursue you in the vehicle, they have to drive against traffic. That's a... Okay, That that's a good tip. I never really thought of that. But even if... Uh, even if someone has a gun pointed at you, it's best to, to quick quickly move and get out of harm's way and att attempt to escape, even if it if it means a chance of getting shot at. As if you're able to make make a clean break, if they want to shoot at you, they're shooting at a moving target. That's true. Which is uh, a difficult proposition, especially with even even with a rifle. And in the dark. <clears throat> Right. The, the, this was nighttime. And, you know, this is probably one of those places where it's just pitch black at night. Yes. Okay, there's not ground lights. This is an oil field. This is an open area, you know. And I know that not every abduction happens like this. But in this case, if they would have been able to get away, they might have been able to. Yes, at the primary crime scene, uh, you have a better chance of surviving if you resist. Mm. But Elmo and Eddie left the bodies in the ditch and they drove LeBlanc's car back to St. Martin Parish. When they got back to Elmo's car, which was a 1961 Dodge Dart, they discovered that the car had a flat tire and they used the, t the car jack from David LeBlanc's car to change the tire. And the following day, the brothers disposed of the driver's licenses that belonged to David LeBlanc and Loretta Bork. They also buried the weapons that they used in the murders. But it does need to be noted that they kept David LeBlanc's car jack in Elmo's car. And this was one of the things that was found during the investigation that was used as evidence against the Sonnier brothers. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> hmm. All right, we are going to be back after this quick break. And we are back. <clears throat> so, the Sonnier brothers were arrested on December the 5th, 1977. A witness had come forward and told police that he had seen a Dodge Dart in the remote area the night of the murders. 
and it did not take the police long to trace this car back to Elmo Patrick Sonnier. Elmo voluntarily confessed to the police upon arrest that he abducted David LeBlanc and Loretta Bork. He also confessed to raping Loretta and to the murder of the couple. He also wound up confessing again while being transported to jail and he made a third confession the following day, which was videotaped. So he confessed three times. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yes. When his home was searched, police found the handcuffs that had been used to restrain David and Loretta in his bedroom. They also found David LeBlanc's car jack, and later they discovered the buried guns that had been used. A bullet from one of the victims matched the guns, and another match was made from the casings found at the crime scene. And cash in the amount of $40 was found in Elmo's possession, and he could not account where he got it from, but a similar amount was carried by the teenagers. So not only did he, not only did they kill him, kill them, they took their money too. Yeah, cold, very cold blooded. Very cold blooded. Both brothers were indicted on two counts of first degree murder. Even though Elmo Sonnier had confessed three times to law enforcement, he entered a plea of not guilty. Even though he had confessed three times, in court he entered a plea of not guilty and then he pled not guilty by reason of insanity. During the trial, Elmo... Yeah, that's after he lawyered up. <laughs> yeah, that's after he lawyered up. public defender. Yes, but it's still representation. During the trial, Elmo and Eddie traded accusations as to who actually pulled the trigger on the rifle that killed David and Loretta. Yeah, that, that, that's a winning defense right there for <laughs> co-defendants to point the finger at each other. <laughs> yeah, that's very, very desperate tactic on the point of defendants it it never works well as you may know brian <clears throat> under louisiana law any person who participates in the killing of another human being may be subject to the death penalty but the extent of participation may be considered during the penalty phase now the sonniers did also say that they were not under the influence of alcohol or drugs when they committed the crime so at least they didn't try to blame it on that. Um, as, as if that, as if that's a legitimate excuse or something to blame it on. When uh, millions of people abuse alcohol and drugs and aren't running around murdering people, that's quite true. Yeah, some many of these people sure will steal stuff to sell to support or steal money, support their habits. Uh, but they're they're not generally not running around murdering people. Eddie Sonnier testified that he held a flashlight while the defendant shot the victims with a 22 caliber rifle. He further related that Loretta Bork began to cry when the first shot was fired at her, which missed. The defendant then fired a second shot, which succeeded in striking Bork in the back of the head, and a third shot struck LeBlanc in the back of, of the head. Each victim was then shot two additional times, and at the trial, expert testimony indicated that any one of the shots would have resulted in, in instantaneous death to the victims. No. Elmo was inevitably convicted of first-degree murder, and he was sentenced to death based on his confessions, and as well as Eddie Sonnier's testimony that Elmo had initiated the crime. Do you have something to say? So apparently one was following the other, but did nothing to stop the other. That's yes, exactly. Which is another explanation for the for the confession. But <clears throat> in the end, this made no difference because separate juries each returned guilty verdicts on both Elmo Sonnier and Eddie Sonnier. Both were sentenced to death, and after their first appeal, the death sentences were reversed due to procedural mishaps and new sentencing hearing, hearings were issued. During this time, 
Eddie Sonnier dramatically recanted his testimony during Elmo's second penalty hearing. He claimed that he had done the actual killings and not Elmo. He also expressed that he was the more dominant offender and even sent a letter to then Governor Edwin Edwards explaining this. Amazing. A, a, a little a little a little bit of remorse about his about his partner. Mm. In spite of Eddie's new testimony, the prosecution successfully attra- attacked his credibility and therefore was able to establish that Elmo was the most in charge of the criminal situation. So the state of Louisiana imposed a second sentence of death on Elmo and Eddie's sentence was changed to life without the possibility of parole. No, it sounds like the system pretty much worked in this case. Yes, and the jury's threshold question was whether Elmo Patrick Sonnier was the principal criminal, right, or Mm -hmm. a compliant follower. So the jury did conclude that Elmo was in charge. Okay, and yeah, it was. It's likely that his little brother was just following him along. Yeah, but this isn't uh, joy riding in a car or shoplifting. No, it's really not. So Elmo Patrick Sonnier was, uh, was again sentenced to death, and they the jury upheld that it was warranted by the record. Okay. Now, while on death row, Elmo Patrick Sonnier was contacted by Sister Helen Prejean. She became his spiritual advisor, and the two formed a close relationship. Sister Prejean attended Elmo's execution. And according to the book Dead Man Walking, Elmo struggled with ambivalent feelings towards the fathers of his victims. Uh, Both of the men asked to attend Elmo's execution. And Prejean sat with Elmo during his final hours. Godfrey Bork and Lloyd LeBlanc were granted permission to witness the execution. And Elmo had heard news reports quoting Bork as saying that he would like to pull the switch himself. And in response to this, Elmo angrily expressed to Sister Prejean that if they want to pull the switch, okay, then let them. Through much of his last day, he smoked a lot of cigarettes and drank a lot of coffee, which is the classic anxiety combination and probably the, the one that you can acquire the easiest in prison. Yeah, that's qu- quite true. So, in the end... Sister Prejean convinced Elmo that redemption would only be achieved through through repentance and taking responsibility for his role in the murders. And according to Sister Prejean, Elmo had said that he did not want his final words to be angry ones. So that day, uh, Sister Prejean and Elmo Sonnier talked through a steel mesh window for most of the day. And he said that he was not angry with his brother, Eddie, and he dictated a letter to Sister Prejean to give to his brother. And in the letter, he told him to be cool, keep his head, and stay out of trouble. He ended it with, I love you, your big brother. And Elmo never really believed that his appeal would be successful. And he did have a last meal. It was a steak dinner. And after he ate, the death house phone rang. And a guard came and told Elmo Sonnier that his appeals had been turned down by the federal courts. And he looked at Sister Prejean and said, I'm not going to make it. Then, minutes later, Sonnier received a telephone call from then-Governor Edwin Edwards who insisted that he personally deliver the news, that he decided not to interfere with the criminal process, and that the execution would move forward. And Sister Prejean said it was then that there was fear and anguish on his face. 
So this is a moment that somebody has learned that there's no hope any longer. Yeah, where they say there, there's life, there's no hope. Uh, proponents of the death penalty who oppose life in prison for murder, they say where there's life, there's hope, and, and there is a lot of truth to that. Mm, yes. And in Elmo Sonnier's fi final moments, uh, guards that were dressed in black came in and shaved his head, eyebrows, and legs. Elmo started talking about life after death, and he vowed that no one was going to see him break. At the permission of, of Warden Ross Maggio, Prejean was allowed to follow Elmo Sonnier to the execution chamber. With her hand on his shoulder, she read from Isaiah chapter 43, which says, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. Lead out the people who are blind, though they have eyes, who are deaf, though they have ears. Once in the execution chamber, Elmo Sonnier directed his last statement to Lloyd LeBlanc, saying, I can understand the way you feel. I have no hatred in my heart. As I leave this world, as I leave this world, I ask God to forgive me for what I did. I also ask your forgiveness for what I did. LeBlanc nodded at, at Elmo Sonnier. And then Loretta's father said, he didn't ask me. So in that moment, Elmo did not want to address Loretta's father at all. Yeah, only the condemned knows the reason for that he may have seen it as pointless <clears throat> perhaps he felt he might anger the father or perhaps he thought it was enough that hit his his uh <clears throat> life was being taken at uh, at an early age yeah uh, as <clears throat> as payment to society <clears throat> mm. Then Elmo Sonnier was strapped into what's known as Gruesome Gertie, that's the state's oak electric chair. While the guards secured him to the chair, he caught Sister Prejean's eye. He told her, I love you, to which she replied, I love you too. Then his face was covered with a veil, and the executioner pulled the switch at 12.07 a.m. This sent four alternating jolts of 2,000 volts and 500 volts of electricity through his body and he was pronounced dead at 12.12 a.m. Shortly after, Warden Maggio, on behalf of the state of Louisiana, announced that the sentence of death had been carried out and Elmo Patrick Sonnier was 33 years old at the time of his death. So it was that, yeah, a pretty timely execution. <clears throat> by by today's standards pretty much yes yeah and you know again you know this is somebody who just thinking about the type of person that he was um, does not really it, this is not somebody I ever would have wanted to meet <clears throat> no and, and it's someone that most people wouldn't be interested in trying to redeem. <clears throat> right. Yeah. Um, of course, the criminal justice system did, you know, did its duty by giving him a fair trial <clears throat> and carrying out the, the death sentence, uh, which, of course, is his his pe you know his penalty okay um, e ending his life before he could uh, <clears throat> you know he he's only living out one third of his life a as a penalty and at the same time <clears throat> sister Prejean, uh is working for a different system 
is working on behalf of the church, on behalf of God, to <clears throat> to get him to accept responsibility for, for what he did and repent. Yes. So that he could face God on better terms in the afterlife. Yes. Yeah. And you know, of note, uh, she wasn't. To my not, she wasn't really trying to, to, to. She wasn't trying to interfere with the criminal justice system. No, she wasn't. <clears throat> but you know, we we do have religious freedom in this country, and part of of religious freedom means that even the most vile person. It has a right to spiritual advisory. Yes. Whatever that means to, to you. It could mean, you know, you, you uh, discuss things with a nun. It could mean that you get visits from a rabbi. Yeah. It, whatever it means to you. So, in essence, while <clears throat> he was being dealt with by the criminal justice system... Sister Prejean's preparing him to be dealt with by God. Yes. <clears throat> you know, what I mean, again, whatever that might mean. I mean, there's no way that we can really, truly know. So, it, you know, it did not, in the end, uh, Sister Prejean did not interfere with the criminal justice system. <clears throat> and did what she felt, what she felt to be right, did what... It would actually take the strongest of people to do. Yes. To, to endure the presence of this cold-blooded killer on, on, behalf, on behalf of God. And not only <clears throat> that, just the fact that, you know, the, the victim's families were also pretty upset that she was advising him. And I can understand why. You know, if something like that happened to somebody I cared about, I would probably feel a lot differently than I do about it right now. You know, I would say, well, why is that person worthy of redemption? They took away my loved one. Right. That's... She... It's important to understand that she wasn't trying to redeem him on this earth. She was trying to redeem him for the afterlife. <clears throat> you know, understanding that he was taking responsibility and getting penalized to the full extent of the laws of man for what he did on earth. Right. But she was trying to get him ready for the afterlife. A different world. She was trying to get him to determine for himself <clears throat> before before leaving the earth whether or not he wanted he wanted to sincerely and truly repent in the eyes of God and choose a different existence for himself in the afterlife. Whereas absent of all of that, he's choosing hell. <clears throat> And of course, the Catholic Church, and I do agree with this, is of the belief that you don't, you're not sent to hell, you choose hell. Mm. Because going, 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 one of the ways to define hell is simply the absence of God's presence. Oh. So someone who, who chooses to be in hell or chooses to be, to not be in God's presence is going to be in hell. <clears throat> mm. Okay. And of course, Sister Prejean was was trying to get him to understand that his uh, his desire to repent had to be genuine, <clears throat> because even though theoretically, of course, he could lie to her, he can't lie to God. She had to get him to understand that if he was not sincere in repenting and accepting consequences, then God would know this. And <clears throat> also, it, it could also have been about getting him to face himself and what he did, which can be just as important. You know, you as a, as a person, you whatever it is you do, you must come to terms with it. 
Yes, yes, quite quite true. And I mean, in this case, he was he was convicted. He was sentenced to death. His death was going to be carried out. So there was nothing more that could be done within the, the criminal justice system or within the law to him. Right. So that was it. All that remained, all that remained, was his relationship with God. Right. After after leaving after leaving the earth. <clears throat> and someone like Sister Prejean was one of those rare individuals who could actually work with an individual like this. <clears throat> Whereas most other people would not be able to endure having a conversation with the, with, with this kind of person. Understandably so. Yes, like I said, these types of people do terrible, terrible things to others. I would not have the stomach to do Sister Prejean's work at all. Yes, I mean this is it's this is very different than say, like a time when I went to confession elementary school when I confessed to starting a fight. Right. Okay. <laughs> very, very, very different. Any priest could handle talking to a child about picking fights at school. Right. <clears throat> well, Helen Pre Sister <clears throat> Helen Prejean and other Catholic nuns did take responsibility of ensuring a proper Catholic burial for Patrick, Elmo Patrick Sonnier. The service was presided over by a bishop, which was usually unheard of for <clears throat> those who were not well-respected members of the Catholic Church. The funeral was held at a Baton Rouge area funeral home, and Elmo Patrick Sonnier was laid to rest in, in Roselawn Memorial Park in a burial, burial plot normally reserved for nuns. Among those in attendance was his brother and his accomplice, Eddie, who was heavily shackled. And Eddie did go on. He died in, I believe, 2008. Just, or just, so he... Died behind bars. Died behind <clears throat> bars, yes. Yeah. So he, he served his penalty on earth. Both of them did, yes. Yes. And that's more or less the first story. And, you know, we, we did talk a lot about our feelings in this one, didn't we? We, cer we certainly did. Um, or interpretations. Right. You right. know, it, it explain rationalizing the actions of a member of the church. In right. this instance. And th this... The story is, although the story is tragic in every way you look at it, it is an example of an instance where the criminal justice system worked uh, as intended, as intended, and the and the Catholic Church also worked as, as intended. intended. Yes. Right. Okay. okay. Because keep in mind, the Catholic Church is not judgmental, or they're not supposed to be. No, they're not. They're, well, okay, they're not supposed to be judgmental, and they're supposed to administer to the religious needs of everyone, regardless of who they are. <clears throat> so, do you have any more final thoughts before we wrap up for this week? Well, aside from uh, from an example of where the criminal justice system works and where the church the church works. Uh, in, in general, this is a cautionary tale of self-preservation and protection. Even as an adult, don't put yourself into a vulnerable situation. In if, you a, can, if you can help it. Yeah, in a dark, desolate area where a predator might be looking for someone to victimize. This is why I don't <clears throat> go camping. Being honest. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Give me a house, please. <laughs> <laughs> Not a tent. <laughs> yeah, the only camping I, I've done was in Civil Air Patrol on the grounds of this airfield in, uh, in Jennings, Louisiana, and in the Marine Corps. And, well, of course, we were in the Marine Corps Infantry Unit, and we were armed to the teeth. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> quite safe. A big, 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 big difference there, but tiny bit of camping advice. At the very least, you go camping. Bring uh, 
10% formula bear mace with and, you. And it and, can be used to protect you against a bear or a person. And bring bring a good firearm too. Yes, yes. At least one. And, and of course, maybe you, two. You're, you're facing a bear. Bear mace. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Several recorded instances of people's lives being saved when they used bear mace upon a bear. The bear all of a sudden feels irritated and does not associate the irritation with you, probably thinking it's the weather or something, and turns around and leaves. Mm -hmm. And then the and then the mace just wears off. You see, whereas you know against a bear or the firearm, uh, stopping power is pretty is pretty iffy. You know, mm -hmm. of course, you wound the bear and the bear gets you anyway. And then there's instances of of hunters. Uh, you know, trying to point a rifle or a shotgun at the bear, and then the bear grabs them before they can do that. Whereas a can of mace is much more easy to maneuver there. Of course, what Tracy means by bringing a firearm with you camping is to give yourself protection against a predator or a human being. Or, or a bear. <clears throat> right? Or a bear. Well, the <laughs> average person can't handle the, the type of handgun that could take down a bear very well, you know, like 44 Magnum, 454 Kessel Magnum, 460 Magnum, stuff like that. Okay. Or 50 caliber Smith & Wesson. <laughs> so a, a shotgun would not be good protection against a bear? You'd have to get the drop on the bear in advance and really see that bear coming. Mm. Which can be difficult with the bear's camouflage. Right? Right? Yeah, yeah, they yeah, they they, they tend to blend. They tend to blend in pretty good. Yeah, until they stand up and on your hind mm -hmm. legs, and they're a lot taller than you, and you're like, oh no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. But on the subject of bears, yes, cocaine bear was a <laughs> uh, gratuitously uh, nice cheesy eight nineteen eighties period film that was that was funny. Well, the, the bear movie that I was thinking of was a, a movie called Backcountry wherein this couple goes camping and one of them gets mauled to death by a bear and I don't remember if the other person lived or not. I don't think she did. And I do think it was based on a true story. It's been quite a while since I've seen this movie. But I never forgot it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right, everybody. Until next week, be safe, be kind. Remember that we're all human beings. Don't park next to vans. And most importantly, don't miss the bear. <laughs> <laughs> if it's dark, it's dangerous. Don't be there in the first place. And if you're there, be armed and ready to deal with a threat. A threat that you wouldn't meet with if you were, weren't there in the first place. And if you get caught there and you defend yourself and you're talking, therefore you'll be talking to law enforcement in an official capacity, lawyer up. <laughs>